Get ready to listen, learn, and earn CE hours. This podcast features content from an accredited CE activity provided by Calibri Healthcare. Visit EliteLearning.com slash podcasts for accreditation and disclosure statements and instructions on how you may be able to earn CE credits. Hello and welcome to our discussion on COVID-19, the pandemic. I'm Leanna McGuire, your host for this Elite Learning Podcast, and our guest is Dr. Daniel Griffin. We are back with part two of this podcast series. Dr. Griffin is a physician scientist, board certified in internal medicine and infectious disease with expertise in global health, tropical medicine, parasitology, and virology, including SARS, CoV-2, also known as COVID-19. Welcome back, Dr. Griffin. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. What we'd like to talk about on this second half of this podcast, or part two, is um, interpersonal relationships within healthcare. So people are tired. They're burnt out from COVID. It's been a really tough couple of years. We want to talk about the best way to um, improve or maintain good communication interprofessionally so that we get the best outcomes for our patients given current situations. Let's talk about the toll it's taken on the healthcare profession and those in it. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, interprofessional responsibilities, how um, looking after patients in this kind of environment, how do we have the best communication between, say, even physicians and nurses to talk about uh, situations So can you talk to us about that or even share some examples? Sure. I mean, this is a great area to to actually share stories and then then couch the discussion in that context. So um, I'll bring everyone back to the early days of the pandemic. So here it is, March of 2020. Um, You know, here in New York, we're we're being hit multiple deaths per day. Um, I think we were up at 2,000 deaths per day just right in our immediate tri-state area. Um, you know, all of us working these incredibly long hours, um, physicians, nurses, respiratory assistants, really everyone, even janitorial staff, right? It's a full team effort. Um, and, it, and it was mm. tough, um, you know, as, as clinicians, particularly as infectious disease consultants, we really had a, a large number of people to see. I mean, I, at my hospital, there were two of us, and we basically said every single patient that comes in with COVID, we will make sure we see them and provide a consultation. Um, but you can't see every single pa- person every day. Um, so things were coming up, and it really was critical to have a really positive working relationship with all of my colleagues, and I'm going to say particularly mm. the nurses. I mean, the nurses were there. They were at the bedside. Um, and they would let me know, hey, Dr. Griffin, you know, such and such medicine, we won't mention it, um, you know, th- this patient's on a non-rebreather, and every time I give them this medicine, they're vomiting into the face mask. Do they really need to be mm. on this? And I would look and say, no, um, you know, it's, I can't imagine there's any medicine that's going to provide a benefit, you know, if it ends up inhaled into their lungs. Um, so really from the early days um, of the pandemic, it became really critical um, to have really good open um, relationships and communication with particularly the nurses in this example, um, but really all the staff. Um, you know, it was hard at times. I have to, we're all mm. tired. Um, it was traumatic. We're seeing our patients die. Um, we're all kind of in a, you know, n- not post-traumatic stress, but sort of an mm-hmm. in the middle of stress disorder, um, you know, and trying to continue to be patient, continue to be collegial, always send the message that you can reach out to me at any time that you need to. Um, now I'll move us into kind of, um, you know, more of the present day and, and that communication. Um, and, you know, just, just last night, um, you know, your patient was getting ready to be discharged. Now they're starting to cough. Now they've got a fever. Um, you know, having that nurse, you know, here's my cell number. You call me at 11 o'clock at night. And, you know, we're seeing, unfortunately, um, you know, patients might come in without a viral disease. Um, and now they've developed a fever and now they've, they've acquired an infection, um, despite sort of the best measures. You know, a lot of times you, you find out it's that husband that's been coming in, you know, and again, the nurse might be the one who says, you know what, their husband was kind of coughing and not doing well the last couple of days. So, you know, we learn a tremendous amount. We provide better care. Um, 
when we have those lines of communication. Open. And are you finding that they are open for the most part in your experience? I mean, obviously it's, I mean, obviously it sounds like it is with you as a physician, but are you seeing that overall as kind of a, with your pulse on the situation, is it improving or are things still pretty tough? Yeah, it, you know, unfortunate, as you sort of suggest, it's not that good sure. everywhere. Right. I mean, a lot of large, particularly academic centers, um, you know, new staff coming and going, um, it, it, you need to develop those relationships. And that, that can be one of the downsides of being at one of these large uh, you know, sort of mega centers. Um, you know, if, if you know the person by name, if they've got your cell phone number and you've got a, a relationship of trust there, um, I think it actually provides better care across the board. I was listening to a, a podcast one of my colleagues, uh, you know, puts up there. Um, you know, and they're talking about sputum and how you should talk to the respiratory therapist. I'm like, don't talk to the respiratory therapist. Go in the room yeah. with the respiratory therapist. Look at the sputum, you know. Um, that's the kind of relationship, I think, that creates better right. care. Um, you know, then you know what's going on. Everyone knows what's going on. The mm -hmm. patient knows what's going on. So, yeah, it, it, with more communication, it's better. And, you know, the early days of the pandemic, it was tough. A lot of the consultations were, doing, were being done remotely. Um, we were limiting the number of people that were going into the room. So maybe, um, you know, one person was physically going into the room and that was the physical exam. Um, but that's really tough because, you know, communication with the patient, communication with the family, communication with, with nursing, um, communication with respiratory therapists, all the other people involved. So really, really challenges. And those challenges continue. And I, and I think, um, unfortunately, Leanne, as you brought up, um, is it really better? You know, a lot of a lot of us. This has been a tough last few years on both sides. So um, yeah, it's it's getting getting hard, and I'm not sure the communication is great in in all right. centers. It would certainly improve the uh, situation of exodus. We do have people leaving the profession. I think that increased communication and empathy. Can you speak to us about empathy? Yeah, I, I think it's important. Um, you know, just because you maybe as a provider um, are going through a tough time. Uh, just realize how hard it is for a nurse who's been mm -hmm. at the bedside when that patient um, that that patient passes, and they they've been there for days, holding their hand, taking care of them, changing them. Um, just you know, I think it's important. We are losing a lot of people from healthcare, and part of it is this. Um, you know, it's tough, and I don't think we are you know there enough for each other. Yeah, so. that that's true, uh, and a lot of a lot of uh, folks within healthcare lost friends who they worked with. I, I, you know, there's plenty of situations in the early days, just pre, pre, I think it was a month before the vaccine came out. Someone I had worked with in ICU had passed away and the folks that worked in that ICU had looked after him. So that was, you know, you hear stories about that a lot. That's a really, really tough thing to have to go through and come back to work the next day. So. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah, I mean, speak directly to that. We, we did lose a lot of our colleagues um, during that first year. And it it's was awful. Um, and, you know, we didn't, we didn't have vaccines. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, you know, one of my colleagues, young pregnant um, woman actually did oh. not survive. I mean, it's just yeah. horrible, right? Um, you know, and so it, it, it's, you know, and some would survive COVID and then just the, the stress, you know, one of my colleagues actually ended up committing suicide mm -hmm. after surviving COVID. I mean, how, yeah. how horrible. Um, so yeah, the, the amount of, um, you know, I guess mental challenge here. And then unfortunately, while we're trying to take care of these folks, this tremendous, um, hostile anti-science, oh, yes. you know, where, you know, here you are doing everything you can to take care of folks. And, um, a lot of us are being targeted, you know, death threats, absurdities. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of people have really just said enough, you know, they've either left the profession, they've shut down social media. They've just stopped talking and sharing the information because of the hostility. Unfortunately, there's a lot of money on the other side, and people are willing to do a lot of stuff um, to protect that uh, that revenue stream. So, yeah, it's it's been really tough on some. Yeah, it went from applause to hostility um, in a very short period yeah. of time. So that's that's really hard to take. So, advice for we have obviously a lot of nurses listening to this. What can nurses do to improve that interprofessional communication if they're having an issue with someone or a physician? Uh, what What do you think would be the best course of action for them to improve that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a challenge. I mean, hopefully at each medical center, there's at least one clinician who they can talk to and maybe share, you know, hey, you know, so-and-so is a bit difficult, and then maybe that person can can help them. Um, it doesn't help to confront someone yeah. who's hostile and tell them that they're hostile. <laughs> I don't think that makes it any better. No. Um, but no, like talk to your colleagues, sort of find out, you know, like, what are you doing? And, and you know, and even just sometimes sharing that, you know, so-and-so is a jerk, uh, you know, can sort of help you. You feel like, okay, it's not yes. just me, um, you know, because venting, <laughs> venting is <laughs> I good have to say, I mean, you don't, yeah. I mean, people that go into nursing, my, my oldest daughters, uh, we going, going into nursing, um, it's a tremendous uh, profession. You don't go into it for fame. You're definitely not there for the money. Um, you're there mm -hmm. to make a difference. And I think that, you know, if you're, you're not treated well, then something's wrong with the person who's not right. treating you. Well. Right. Is it beneficial, you think, to go to a medical director or would it be better course of action to go to a nurse manager if there's an issue? Yeah. So, you know, talk to your colleagues, talk to your nurse manager. I mean, nurse managers have just many, many years of experience and, and really, and some of them are just tremendous and really can help provide you some guidance on, you know, what should you do? What's the next step? It was interesting when you said, don't tell somebody who's hostile that they're hostile. The other thing is to, if someone's, if someone's upset, <laughs> You're being telling them to too. calm down never works. That's the other thing, right? I always think when some, when someone's upset and they say, calm down. Oh yeah, that's working. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> But don't, but don't just be quiet. Don't just no. take it. Actually talk to your colleagues, talk to your supervisor. Find, you know, if there's a problem, um, no one should be treated uh, poorly right. in the workplace. I think another thing, and I think this goes uh, for all, for everyone in that interprofessional relationship is that if you do lose your temper, everybody involved, that it's okay to fess up about that. Like own it, uh, apologize afterwards. And yeah. Uh, and move forward, because I think that shows a lot of maturity and empathy as well. Excellent. Um, so the day to day, and you're still seeing it with issues across the board a little bit, right? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, our COVID ward um, is is full at the the hospital where I work. I continue to see acute COVID and lots of post COVID in my um, in my outpatient practice. Um, yeah, it, it's here. Our urgent cares are still seeing lots and lots of cases. It's not going anywhere. Um, if anything, we're at the highest level of hospitalized uh, folks with COVID since, well, September. So we're, we're climbing again. Um, deaths are climbing again. Um, we're already starting to see that post-Thanksgiving um, surge. When we're talking about the interprofessional relationships, I know you travel a lot. Any thoughts on different uh, different countries or cultures or aspects of that? Are we all kind of similar in our in the, where we're at post? I don't want to say post COVID because we're not post COVID, but you know what I mean. Um, how yeah. how do we compare? Yeah, well, the tomorrow, the day after we record this, um, probably you know before or after people are listening, but um, I'm heading to Uganda for um, for post of December. Um, and there I'll be, um, you know, initially the, the first part of the trip, I'll be working in a remote clinic, Eastern Uganda, Kenyan border, um, where almost all the care is provided mm. by, by nurses, um, not by physicians. So once a week, there's a physician there. Periodically, there'll be um, someone like myself who goes, um, a lot of it is, is education and working with the nurses because they're going to be the ones taking care of the patients when mm -hmm. we're gone. They're going to be the ones taking care of the patients all those days of the week when there isn't a local provider around. Um, so there, it's a, it's a different dynamic. Um, I have to say in Eastern Uganda, there's 15 different languages spoken. I don't speak most of them. The nurses do, which is amazing. Um, so there, it's a much different relationship. There, there are fewer and fewer um, physicians in many parts of the world. So there, there's much more reliance on nurses. There is much more required communication and, and education. Um, so that they can they can function in those areas. So um, it is different in different parts of the world. Um, I was in Panama about six months back, um, working in some of the remote locations. Um, I dragged my oldest daughter along with us. Um, and there, again, very few um, physicians. And so a lot of nurse practitioners, a lot of advanced practice nurses helping um, with the care. So uh, areas where it's really critical that there's good communication wow, skills. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. That'd be quite the education for your older, oldest daughter if she's in nursing school. So that's, that's impressive. Wow. Um, was she exposed to this? Was she in school when it, at 2020 or has this been since? 
Yeah, so she actually, in you know, March of 2020, was off at college, and we brought her home a little bit earlier before the yeah. other kids <laughs> stayed home. So that was the You're one right. bonus for me, as I had my daughter, you know, back from college. It was, um, yeah. So she she experienced that. She's actually in her senior year of university now, and hopefully, we'll be starting a nursing school here in the New York area Fantastic. next year. Um, you must be very proud. I was actually, as were several other nurses that I've spoken to, uh, concerned that people would not go into the profession of nursing after COVID, but it actually has been the reverse. Is that correct? Are there more people going into it or medicine? You know, is it, yeah, there, it's interesting. So there are certain areas, right? So there are certain people going, um, more people interested in nursing, which is great. Um, we saw a, a little bit of a surge in in providers going into infectious mm. disease. That seems to be killing <laughs> off. <laughs> we'll see what happens there. Um, but no, there, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people out there that really want to make a difference. And I know that for a lot of people, it's just, you know, they've said, boy, this mm -hmm. was just too much mm -hmm. the last three, three years. And a lot of folks ha have fled the profession. I think fled is the right word. Uh, but no, there, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of idealistic, excited, um, people coming into the area. So I'm very, very positive. That's about great. Future. I'm glad to hear that. Excellent. And it, I think that I'm hoping that um, those entering the profession now will be more empowered to have those conversations and, and, and follow their gut. Do you think there's a, a lot to be said about that? When you're, when you think you should say something to someone, but you're yeah. not sure Oh, I think our I think our younger generation is is well uh, well well versed in, in speaking up. That, that, That's uh, a good thing. <laughs> we think. Yeah, no, I, I think it's positive. You know, I, I sort of joke. You know, that that res be respectful for your elders. Well, don't be respectful to your elders when they're not yes, being respectful yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. And I think our younger generation has learned that if they're not being treated well, that they should yeah. say something. And yeah, and I think they are. That it is interesting. Um, you know, when I think about my mother was a nurse as well and a generation where she got out of her chair when a physician walked in the room, it was, uh, you were very careful what you said. And I think it's really important to feel <laughs> empowered to be able to, uh, to say if you have questions or concerns. I think sometimes people are afraid that they're going to say something wrong or look stupid. Thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. Just, you yeah. know, Take the chance. We're on yeah, the same page absolutely. On that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and if someone gets impatient with you, so be it. That's fine. At least you've you've done what you need yep. to do. So that interprofessional professional relationship is so important. Um, any other thoughts on those relationships? No, I mean, I, I think as we've talked, I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, I think that this younger generation um, you know, has, has learned that um, you know, they should be respected in the workplace there should be less of a hierarchy. It actually um, results in better, better care. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very, very positive about uh, our future. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and hopefully we really learned a lot over these last three years and we'll heal from our wounds and we'll come out, um, you know, all better. I would like to circle back to something that you mentioned in part one of this uh, podcast series. And we have a few minutes is you said we knew there was going to be a pandemic coming. Can you elaborate on that? Is it just because of historical data or um, how did, how did uh, those in the know? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, so, so we, and we is a pretty large group of we, epidemiologists, infectious disease experts, global health, public health people. Um, you know, we live in a, in a sea of microbes. Um, there, there's bacteria, there's parasites, prions, viruses, um, but particularly the viruses. Um, and periodically, we have we've faced a um, a virus that is um, relatively novel to us. Whether it's uh, whether it's a different variant of flu, a rearrangement, and we've seen that happen several times. Um, whether it's a different viral illness, and we've seen a few coronaviruses. Right? We saw SARS one. We saw MERS. Um, so we, we live in a world where we're constantly exposed to viruses. Viruses have the ability to mutate. Actually, that's what they do. Um, so it's always interesting to say, oh my gosh, it's mutating. Of course, that's what viruses do. And so we live in a world where we're always, um, you know, under threat of having um, something spill over from another species, have something that we're used to, but change in a certain way that our immune system is not ready to handle. 
Um, and, and these viruses, um, they take advantage, not in a sort of anthropomorphizing sense, but, but their fitness takes advantage of the fact that human beings like to be around other human beings. We like to talk. We like to be close. Uh, we like that interpersonal um, connection. Um, and so particularly if you are a respiratory pathogen, like the coronaviruses, like influenza, um, you know, we, we are at risk just by doing what we normally do of allowing one of these viruses to spread, allowing it to undergo the selection pressure to become more fit. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that this is just one of our challenges going sure. forward. And we all know the huggers. We all know a hugger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care if I have a mask. Come here. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. That's funny. Another question I wanted to ask you about, and, and it may be an obvious answer and it may not, but when we talk about the maybe potentially overuse of antibiotics over the last couple of de decades and even um, hand sanitizer, I don't know. Have we put ourselves in kind of a place where we're more vulnerable to these viruses or not? So I think one of the biggest challenges, right, we talk about, you know, future pandemics, but we're actually in already in the midst of another pandemic. And this is the pandemic of antimicrobial resistant mm. organisms. And um, we have really overused um, antibiotics to the point where you know, we, we already estimate hundreds of thousands of deaths are due to antimicrobial resistant infections, which should have been easy to treat. We talked a little bit in our first episode about how I'm, I'm always shocked when I hear those antibiotic shortages because they're being used to treat all these respiratory pathogens. It's, that those makes no sense. And so, um, you know, we have to be careful. And as patients, we have to have a conversation with the physician. Don't go in asking for antibiotics. Go in for asking why you may not need them. So if you have a virus, which I think a lot of people now know what that is, um, you don't need a ZPAC. A ZPAC is not going to be helpful, and you're going to live in this society. And as we continue to lose our antibiotics, when you really have something that would benefit from a ZPAC, it will not work for you. Um, so yeah, we're, we're already well into our antimicrobial resistant pandemic. Um, but we can make a difference. We can, we can bring that back. You start reducing your risk. You start reducing your use of those antibiotics. And the bacteria start becoming sensitive again. We have several examples of that. So, so we can back our mm. way out of this. But we've got to do it. We've got to stop misusing. We've got to stop overusing. We've got to stop inappropriately using those antibacterial Good to know. agents. What about herd immunity? Yeah, herd immunity is tough, right? People were talking about this early on. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions in this issue of herd immunity. And so one of the assumptions is that once you've been infected, you're removed from the pool and you can't be mm -hmm. reinfected. Um, and one of the things that um, people who have been studying coronavirus for many years pointed out early on is if you get infected with a coronavirus, you can get reinfected a year later. Um, coronaviruses tend not to give you durable, lifelong immunity from reinfection. So the, the idea of herd immunity um, mm. may not apply. Um, I'm going to say does not apply to coronaviruses. What can we do with vaccines with prior immunity? Um, we think we can reduce your risk of severe disease. We still think there'll be certain individuals that will require um, antiviral therapies and other therapies. Um, but I think we need to, we need to ask, um, does the, the concept of herd immunity apply here? And I think the answer that we've really learned is, is no. Okay, it really good. Glad you cleared that up for us. Do you have any other, just to go back, I I'd like to wrap up this section with a little more discussion on interpersonal relationships. Do you have any other examples or cases that you'd like to share with us um, that can illustrate that? Yeah, I guess maybe we'll, we'll give one and perhaps this will be a closing case, but it was just a case from last week, which I really, I, I think um, extols the importance of good interpersonal um, and it was a it was a lady. She she had cellulitis. She was starting to get better. We were talking about, oh, you know, she should be able to go home in the next day or two. Um, and, and suddenly, the husband who'd been there at the bedside just wasn't there. It was kind of being a oh, she can't come home. We think she needs more IV antibiotics. And, and I was talking to the nurse. I'm like, well, what do you think is going on? I mean, this person doesn't need more IV antibiotics. How would they even know because they haven't been in mm. in a couple of days? Um, and then sort of alerted me, like, well, you know, before he left, he, he was he was coughing a little. He looked like maybe. And so a phone call, a little bit of pressed questions. We realized that the husband wow. actually had COVID. 
right? So the husband's been coming to visit her. Now he went home. The reason he doesn't want her home is Ah. he's got COVID. He's worried she's going to come home and get COVID. But we go and see her and she started to get, you know, a little bit of a raspy throat. We test her. She's got COVID. Um, You know, and I I don't think we would have been able to pick that up uh, without sort of the the observations of of the nurse, her noticing. It's um, one of those, hmm. But the important part is she verbalized (laughs) it, right? That, that, yeah, something fishy here, and she was able to help us get to the bottom. Of right, what was I think there. that's the key: is just being able to verbalize it. Uh, and you know, I was going to say if you feel safe, but even if you don't feel safe, and not, I mean, I, you know, not safe in the sense of blatant hostility, but if you don't feel secure, it all comes down to advocacy for the patient. Correct, ultimately, right. Yeah. Uh, and I think yeah. that if we all keep that in mind. Um, treating them like as, as if they were a member of our family, then you're going to say what you feel in your gut regardless. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate is, is always do what you feel is, is the best thing for your patient. You know, you won't always be there, you know, it won't always be the right decision, but as long as that's your intention. Um, yes. Yeah. And an important thing to remember for those who are new to the profession as well, because that can be a little intimidating initially, but that, that is key. I do believe. Any final words or anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Um, well, I think the big thing is, is to appreciate that this has been a really tough two to three years for for all of us, for physicians, for nurses, for pharmacists, for respiratory therapists, for physical therapists, for the janitorial staff. I mean, really, a lot of people have had a tough last few years. Um, and so we need to be there for each other, um, just emotionally. Um, also, if we're there for each other and we communicate well, our patients do better. We do better. Um, so th- that'll be my final word is, you know, we're we're all part mm-hmm. of the team. Um, and when we see it that way, when we work together. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned all of those departments because that all of it is interprofessional. That's really, really wonderful. Well, I cannot thank you enough for this podcast series. This is really important information. I don't think we can ever hear enough about COVID and what's going on uh, in the current state. So it's been extremely informative. And obviously those interpersonal relationships are crucial. So please don't ever hesitate for our listeners to uh, say what you need to say or what you feel is necessary. Thank you again, Dr. Griffin. We really appreciate your expertise. This has been a a really interesting series. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And everyone be be safe. safe. And thank you all for listening. Again, please uh, check out all the numerous courses and information on EliteLearning.com as you move forward in your career. This is Leanna McGuire for Elite Learning by Calibri Healthcare. This podcast featured content from an accredited CE activity provided by Calibri Healthcare. Visit EliteLearning.com slash podcasts for accreditation and disclosure statements and instructions on how you may be able to earn CE credits. Take your learning to the next level by subscribing to more podcasts on compelling healthcare topics.